Hey everyone, this week's video is on the principles of dialysis access. And I should probably, uh, full disclosure out front, say that I am not a vascular surgeon. And like all of the videos that we make, uh, there's going to be a whole lot more to this topic than we are actually going to cover. Um, but especially for medical students doing surgery rotations, um, it's not just vascular surgeons that do fistulas. Sometimes transplant surgeons do it, other times general surgeons. So it can come up on many different types of surgery rotations. And then really big picture, if we focus again on uh, just being a good doctor as opposed to really crushing rotations or, sh or shelves, um, Almost at every field will have a lot of patients that need dialysis or are currently on dialysis. So it's good to have a basic understanding and kind of fluency with these ideas, no matter what field you go into. So when we talk about, uh, this is kind of what we're going to talk about today. So we can talk about the types of dialysis access and their selection, uh, looking at fistula, which spoiler alert is the uh, best type of long-term access. So we're going to focus a little bit more on that as well as graphs and lines. Uh, then we're going to go into the fistula types and their different locations. And then finally, we're going to finish up with the um, well-known rule of sixes. That's a common uh, pimp question in the OR or the clinic. Um, I probably should have titled this lecture hemodialysis as opposed to dialysis because we are going to ignore peritoneal dialysis uh, for the purposes of this talk. But of course, in real life, remember that that is always an option. All right. So basics. What are fistulas, graphs, and lines? First, I would point out that fistulas are the most preferred long-term option for dialysis. So if we want to say maybe best long-term here, uh, fistulas are the best, followed by graphs, followed by lines. However, if we want to talk about the speed at which you can give somebody dialysis, say they need dialysis emergently, then our errors go the opposite way. So lines are actually uh, the fastest to put in and use, whereas fistulas take about six weeks to mature, and the graphs are somewhere in the middle. Uh, they're not as good long-term as fistulas, uh, but they also take a little bit less time uh, to be functional. So those are some reasons why we have all these options, right? Fistulas aren't appropriate for every scenario. Something like a line can be really good for an emergent scenario, maybe a patient in the ICU whose kidneys have abruptly failed. And they're also good for uh, short-term dialysis. Maybe somebody's septic, they need uh, a few rounds of dialysis, but then their kidneys are likely to recover and they won't need that line anymore. Of course, in that case, you wouldn't want some sort of long-term option like a fistula or a graft. But to back it up and go really basic, so. What are we doing here? We're basically trying to uh, provide a system that will um, take the place of the kidneys. And the kidneys have a pretty significant amount of blood flow. So we're going to need a uh, space with a lot of blood flow that we can hook up to the dialysis machine. And so a fistula is just a connection of your native vein to your native artery. And we'll talk about where these are. Usually they're somewhere in the arm. Um, but essentially what we typically do is we cut the vein and then do an end to side anastomosis of the vein onto the artery. And so now blood flow is diverted through the artery directly up into this vein and you get some really robust blood flow here. This vein, uh, enlarges, uh, gets much bigger, bulkier, and is appropriate for, uh, hooking up to that dialysis machine. So the pros of a fistula is it lasts a long time, although not forever. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and there's no foreign body here. So there's less likelihood of infectious complications, uh, et cetera. A graft is similar to a fistula. Once again, we have an artery and a vein, but for whatever reason, usually issues with vein sizes or central venous stenosis, we're unable to hook the artery and vein up directly. So we have to use a graft of some sort of usually synthetic material to connect the two. So the pros of a graft is otherwise very much like a fistula. Blood comes from the artery through the graft and into the veins. Usually you're cannulating the graft here instead of the vein when we're talking about getting hooked up to dialysis. Um, but the con is that anytime you have a foreign body, there's a risk of uh, more complications. And then finally, talking about lines, these are usually double lumen lines that are placed, or at least double lumen, I should say, that are placed in uh, one of your central venous structures. So if you think about your central lines, those are most commonly your IJ, uh, your subclavian, and your femoral. 
Now, of course, in an emergency setting, when you just need dialysis, especially when it's going to be short term, you just kind of take whatever you can get. But if you're thinking about long term dialysis, uh, if you put one in the femoral space, the patient's not really going to be able to move. Uh, so usually that's not a great option for long term dialysis. And then when we're talking about the IJ versus the clavian, the IJ is usually uh, preferred. And if you think about that, you see so you have your subclavian coming into your IJ, right? All this coming into your central circulation. And it's not uncommon when you have a long-standing line, for example, a dialysis line in here, uh, that it can cause central venous stenosis because it irritates the uh, endothelium of the vessel that it's in. So let's say, for example, you could have a subclavian line coming in here or an IJ coming in here. And you can imagine if this happens in the subclavian, we get this irritation and this stenosis building up, uh, you're going to end up burning the entire limb. You won't be able to put any sort of dialysis access in this limb if you have central venous stenosis affecting the subclavian. Whereas if you have it in an IJ, of course, you were never going to put a fish, dialysis fistula on the patient's head anyway, uh, so that's a little bit less of a loss. A couple other reasons are that the subclavian vein rubs between the first rib and the clavicle. Sorry for that illustration. It's not great, but the point is that with any arm movements, uh, you can kind of smush the vein in the catheter between the first rib and the subclavian. This can lead to more of that central venous stenosis or maybe even catheter fracture. Uh, and then finally, it's usually just safer to place IJs. We've got a really standardized technique that you can use with ultrasound to place IJs, and uh, these bony structures usually uh, make it difficult to use ultrasound uh, when you place lines into the subclavian. All right, so we've talked a little bit about fistulas, graphs, and lines, and once again, since fistulas are the ideal long-term dialysis access, uh, there's been a big push for fistula first, uh, in a lot of places, uh, we're going to go into a little bit more depth about where you want uh, these fistulas. So remembering we said these are usually placed in the arms. So you want to, when you're talking to your patient, get a history of their dominant versus their non-dominant hand. Uh, this is probably obvious, but you usually want to place the fistula on the non-dominant side. Uh, so if they have any symptoms that affect that hand or just they're going to be hooked up to the dialysis machine for hours every week and they want to do stuff with their dominant hand, it's always better to put the fistula in the non-dominant side. Secondly, you can think about distal versus proximal. So for example, in the arm, talking about the forearm versus the anatomic arm or the upper arm. Uh, and the key here is you usually want to start distal, and that's because fistulas, while they are the best long-term dialysis solution, they will go down eventually. It's not natural for the vein to be used in this way. They won't last forever. And so you can imagine if we have maybe a stylized arm here with a hand, right? So if your first dialysis access, you hook up some artery to some vein, we'll talk about which ones later, and you do it up here and this vein goes down. Maybe it's got stenosis at the outflow or whatever. Uh, but if that upper arm dialysis fistula goes down, you cannot, because all these veins are gonna drain up through the same system, you usually cannot do a more distal dialysis access on the same side. However, if you had started down here, and your fistula went down, you could go up and then salvage that with a more proximal fistula. So uh, when I was a medical student, I was told you always want to burn distal to proximal. So always put the dialysis access as distal as you're allowed to. And what we'll choose if you're able to place, or I should say how distal you're able to place that fistula, and that's primarily related to vessel size. Uh, as you can imagine, we need a lot of blood flow, so we need a certain size vessel to make this anastomosis work as well as just technically, uh, vessels are too small, it's really hard to sew them together. So typically the numbers I've been told uh, for an artery, you wanna think at about two millimeters and for a vein, you wanna think over three millimeters. And the way I remember that is arteries are just kind of more robust vessels. They've got thicker walls, they're a little bit easier to handle. Uh, so I think about veins, they're kind of wimpier, weaker vessels, so you need a larger size vein. Uh, than artery for your fistula. All right, so once you've taken all these things into consideration, um, let's talk about how the fistulas, which vessels are actually involved in being hooked up in the fistula and how the naming works. And of course, this is medicine, so we've got to have some useless eponyms for you to memorize, uh, like for example, a semino fistula. But really you can name all these fistulas just by their kind of combining the artery in the vein. 
So for example, a fistula from the radial artery to the cephalic vein would be a radio cephalic fistula. So as long as you know the commonly involved arteries and the commonly involved veins, uh, you can name your fistulas quite easily. So doing that will require knowing just a little bit of vascular anatomy of the upper extremity. So if we start once again with the arm, um, hopefully you can see that this is supposed to be a right arm, the patient's head would be up here, uh, but you have two veins that you have to know. So there's a vein that kind of runs on the top or upper part of your arm and another one that runs uh, lower. Once again, this is if we're assuming the arm is in the anatomic position. And so the one on top or anatomically, the one closer to your head is the cephalic vein, right? Cephalic kind of meaning head. So that's how I rem remember uh, the name of that vein. And then the one below it or on the bottom is the basilic. So bottom, basilic, they both start with B. Uh, and these are the two common veins um, in the arm and forearm that you use for your fistula access. And then when we're talking about arteries. There's also really two main arteries that you need to know. So up here we have the brachial artery that comes down and around the elbow it splits. All right, so up here we have brachial and then down here it splits and once again the vessel close to the head this time that is the radial artery which of course we know that's what, where we take our pulses etc and then down here we have our ulnar artery so the two arteries that we use for fistula access is typically the brachial or the radial we actually don't use the ulnar very much because most people's hands are actually ulnar dominant so if you stole some blood flow from the ulnar artery you have more of a risk of causing ischemia in the hand so once again if we remember our naming convention for example, if we were to hook up the radial artery down here to the cephalic vein, that would be a radiocephalic fistula. That's a common fistula option. And then up here, if we hooked it up the brachial artery to the cephalic vein, that would be the brachiocephalic. Or of course, you could do that to the brachiobasilic as well. All right. And so once you've made your fistula, then you have to wait for it to mature. Like we said, it's not ready right away the way a dialysis, dialysis line is. And so we have this convenient rule of sixes. That's really great uh, material for uh, attendings and residents to ask medical students in the operating room. So let's make sure you know exactly what they're talking about. So first, we're talking about maturation. So it's six weeks for the fistula to mature. Once you've had your operation, it's going to take about a month and a half before the fistula is ready to be used. And of course, we want this thing to be big enough so that vein is going to have to be at least six millimeters in diameter. Uh, we also want to make sure we can stick a needle into it. So we want this space between, if this is the skin overlying the vein, we want that space to be less than six millimeters. So we can easily reach in with our needle and cannulate time and time again when we need dialysis. Like we talked about, we want plenty of blood flow uh, through this fistula so we can get good flows into our dialysis machine. So 600 cc's per minute or more is the cutoff. And then we want it to be at least six centimeters long. Once again, you need to cannulate it for dialysis and you actually need to do that with two needles. So you just wanna make sure there's enough space where you can easily get two needles uh, into that area. All right, so to review, we've talked about the types of dialysis access and their selection. Remember, fistula first. Uh, you get a fistula if you can. This is best for long-term access. Lines are at the other end of the spectrum. If you have uh, temporary short-term access, lines are great. And then uh, graphs are somewhere in the middle where if you can't do a fistula, usually due to those anatomic concerns that we talked about with vessel sizes, then you might have to settle for a graft. Uh, we've talked about the fistula types and their location. Um, remember, you always want to start distal and then go proximal. So you save as much vasculature as possible for future dialysis access locations. Know your two arteries, which are the radial and the brachial. And know your two veins, which are the cephalic and the basilic. And then finally, uh, be ready to be asking the OR or the clinic about your rule of sixes uh, that will tell you when your fistula is matured and ready to be used. All right, that's it. Um, these videos are for educational purposes only. Uh, please do not use them to diagnose or treat any diseases, and we'll see you next time.